So let's take a look now beyond the ratings and look at the qualitative research. We've been talking about the quantitative. We've been talking about numbers. Let's look now at some details. Your client will demand more than ratings. Being number one means nothing to the client if the audience that makes you number one doesn't buy the product your client sells. If you have a product that might be geared towards a more mature audience, uh, it may be beneficial for you to advertise on a media outlet that doesn't have the large overall numbers, but has a stronger mature audience because you can tailor that message to that particular audience as opposed to spending a lot of money for a lot of ears or a lot of eyes that may not have any interest at all in what it is that you're selling. With qualitative data, not only do we know who is watching or listening, but we also learn sociographic characteristics pertaining to income levels and social status, demographics referring to age and gender, and psychographics. Psychographics is a measure of attitudes and lifestyle traits. So we're talking more about uh, beliefs, values, uh uh, our temperaments and that sort of thing when we're talking about psych psychographics and it segments us a, a lot more than what typical demographics do where demographics tend to focus mostly on age, sex, race, uh, perhaps culture. Uh, psychographics tends to narrow that down even more. Most media outlets find it cost prohibitive to conduct their own qualitative studies, so they often will share information in what's known as syndicated research packages. One of the big ones out there is called Scarborough, which is a uh, arm of Nielsen, and it's a tool that salespeople use to be able to look up uh different buying habits of certain types of people and be able to match up businesses and spending habits with a uh, particular television or radio station and the format that they're in. So, uh, for example, you may look up the percentage of people that listen to talk radio that buy luxury vehicles and be able to show those sorts of numbers to a prospective advertiser uh, to make the argument that uh, a luxury vehicle dealership would do well to advertise to uh, the talk radio station audience, which has a lot of its target audience available right there. Qualitative information includes data collected in one or more of the following categories, and these are the ones that the book lists, activities, interests, media behavior, recreation, social activity, purchase patterns, opinion, and demographics. Uh, all these things uh, factor in to being able to make the best decision uh, as an advertiser as to where you want to spend your advertising dollars because you want to try to reach the audience where it is at and make sure that your audience and the audience of the media outlet matches. So we can see Selling electronic media means selling the fragmented audiences that are the result of the explosion of media choices. As our tastes and interests are being splintered off and we're all going to the various channels to which we find uh, entertainment or information that is compelling to us and attractive to us, so are the advertisers as they're trying to find us and be able to uh, market their products and services to us. Speaking of targeting, the main aim of the new targeting ability is to reach customers with specific messages delivered in familiar, even specific language about how products and services fit them personally. Uh, so it is uh, tr not just reaching out to the audience, but also making sure that uh, the language, the presentation, the appeal is attractive to the target audience as well. Another form of targeting goes beyond chasing 
undesirables away or simply excluding them in the first place. This is what we call tailoring. Tailoring is the capacity to aim media content and ads at particular individuals. We're seeing this especially in new media right now where you can have psychographics in such a tightly niched way that uh, you can target specific people with a specific terp temperament in a specific zip code uh, that are of a certain age and, and the, the amount of the amount of parameters that you can narrow down to uh, is unlimited and you can custom make those messages as much as you want to. In the world of television and radio, uh, we may not necessarily want to get that narrow cast, but we can uh, still create messages that are going to be tailor fit uh, to uh, fairly narrow audiences, especially with the formats that are available in radio and television these days, even on broadcast television where certain programs are going to appeal to certain types of people. Researchers are now able to uncover relationships among demographic, attitudinal, behavioral, and geographic elements of the population, and these relationships are called clusters. How do all these things work together and create the ideal uh, target for your message? Uh, you can almost think of it as kind of creating a certain persona of sorts as to uh, who your ideal customer is going to be and how you're going to reach out to that particular customer. So let's talk about clustering. By combining demographic data, a market can be grouped into clusters also known as geodemographic segmentation systems. Now, just a big name for the fact that we're talking about reaching certain people in certain places and rather specific places at that. Cluster systems take many demographic variables and create profiles of different individual or household characteristics, purchase behaviors, and media preferences. So we're again we're segmenting as uh, uh, as real tight and close as we possibly can here. You might use cluster analysis and geocoding to show a prospect that your audience and the advertiser's customers are one and the same and that they live within a few miles of the advertiser's business. Uh, so this is really helpful, especially for uh, stations that may have smaller audiences or smaller coverage areas, that if you can prove to an advertiser that a bulk of their uh a bulk of the audience they're trying to reach is captured by your station despite those limitations, it still may be a valuable investment for them to go with a campaign on your station. The geographic element is the one thing that distinguishes clusters from psychographic segments. Another difference is that cluster categories are based on socioeconomic and consumer data and not attitudinal data. So one sort of distinction that happens there, we're talking more about geography and social status, not necessarily as much about beliefs, attitudes, values, although they do play in a little bit, but we'll talk about that a little bit more here with psychographics. Psychographics usually refer to a formal classification system that categorizes people into specific types based largely on psychological characteristics. Uh, so we tend to lump together psychographic and lifestyle uh, descriptions. There's some similarities, but there is a distinction. When we're talking about lifestyle, we're talking not just about the, the mental, the psychological. We're also uh, talking about organizing by way of attitude or consumer behavior. So this brings up opinion. Uh, this brings up uh, philosophies. Uh, and that sort of thing that may be a little different from psychological, which tends to focus more on the mental and the emotional. And then cluster systems are based on purchase behavior and demographics, such as age, sex, uh, age rather, sex, income, and education. So all these things, uh, while very distinct, all kind of work together 
to help us to create uh, that persona that I talked about earlier of the ideal customer that an advertiser is going to be reaching out for and then using that uh, as a basis to be able to match up with uh, a media outlet that would be beneficial for that advertiser to invest in with a campaign. Vows, the values and lifestyle system. There's a uh, drawing in your textbook that shows this in a graphical sort of way, uh, in a way that we can try to explain it here. Vows consumer groups are shown graphically on a matrix with uh, two different dimensions. One dimension is self-orientation. Self-orientation moves from principle-oriented towards action-oriented, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit. The other dimension is resources, moving up from low resources to high resources. And that's kind of self-explanatory there in terms of uh, the availability that you have for uh, being able to purchase things that you need. Self-orientation. People pursue and acquire products, services, and experiences that provide satisfaction and give shape, substance, and character to their identities. So there's this sense that the things that you buy, the things that you acquire, uh, improve your quality of life in one way or another and kind of uh, shape who you are as a person. People are motivated by one of these powerful self-orientations. And it's going to be one of these three. One, based on principle, Principle-oriented customers are guided in their choices by abstract, idealized criteria rather than by feelings or events or desire for approval. Uh, this is going to be those that have uh, strong philosophical or political or spiritual points of view that help kind of guide uh, the way they see consumerism and the purchasing of products and services. Status-oriented consumers look for products and services that demonstrate the consumer's success to their peers. So having the more expensive or the more quality or the more name brand items uh, is something that's going to appeal to those that uh, want to achieve a high status. Action-oriented consumers are guided by a desire for social or physical activity, variety, and risk-taking. So they like things that get them involved and, and help them to be active or social. Resources, again, refers to the full range of psychological, physical, demographic, and material means or capacities to buy things. Also refers to energy level. Uh, so there's kind of the uh, positional, the logistical means to be able to buy the things that are needed or wanted uh, and the drive that is uh, available to do so. Uh, a lot of these things are going to be controlled from outside sources, such as how much income you make, your ability to earn, uh, your your physical ability to do things, those sorts of things. That's what's meant by resources. So now there's eight different consumer types that Vows uh, talks about, and we give a brief description of each of them from the textbook. Achievers are successful career and work-oriented people who like to and generally do feel that they're in control of their lives. So they're the ones that seem to have it all together, if you will. Actualizers are successful, sophisticated, active, take charge kind of people with high self-esteem and abundant resources. Uh, they don't have to work super hard to do what they want to do. They just go and do it. Believers are conservative, conventional people with concrete beliefs based on traditional established codes, things like family and church and patriotism, a uh, sense of community, those kinds of things. Experiencers are young, vital, enthusiastic, impulsive, and rebellious. They seek variety and excitement, uh, savoring the new, the offbeat, and the risky. Uh, these are people that uh, want what's now, what's in the moment, and, and trying to uh, take in things 
as they're available and as they're happening. The fulfilled are mature, satisfied, comfortable, reflective people who value order, knowledge, and responsibility. They're system sort of people. They know what works. They know what they want. That's what they go for. Makers. Makers are practical people who have constructive skills and values self-sufficiency. Uh, they don't need a lot from the outside. They kind of do for themselves and things that help them to do for themselves, they're attracted to. Strivers seek motivation, self-definition, and approval from the world around them. Uh, so looking for the, the motivation and encouragement from others, uh, sometimes maybe needing a little bit of help from others. Strugglers have constricted lives. Uh, they're chronically poor. Uh, they're, uh, low skilled. They don't have strong social bonds. Uh, they may be elderly people that are concerned about their health. Uh, they're often uh, with attitudes that are more resigned and passive. Uh, so they're people that, uh, may not necessarily have full control of what's going on about them and may not necessarily always be able to do the things that they need to or that they want to. Using research to sell. Television sellers are now creating demographic profiles and qualitative profiles of their programs. Uh, you'll see in the textbook where it lists uh, examples of different types of cable networks in particular, uh, where you're seeing uh, the more uh, format-based, more demographic-based programming that television is doing. And uh, again, we've mentioned that uh, even broadcast television to a certain extent is doing that where some of the newer networks, like the CW, for example, caters to a more young audience. Uh, CBS is known for a lot of the police dramas and that kind of thing. Uh, and the different networks, whether on broadcast or on cable, are reaching out and attracting certain demographics uh, and certain segments of the population. So they are, again, moving more towards that sort of a sales model in the way that radio has been for a long time. The research police. Advertisers need to know not only the ratings, but also the reliability of the numbers that the ratings represent. So, again, it's not just about how many eyeballs, but uh, what eyeballs are viewing, what earlobes are listening. And uh, is it not just the right demographic, but is it a demographic that is going to pull the trigger and be interested in and perhaps uh, patronize the business that is to be advertised? Key thing here, credibility. Credibility is crucial since so much money rides on every decision. And we're talking about credibility uh, in terms of the data that's presented by media outlets in both the quantitative and the qualitative research. We're talking about credibility in terms of the uh, reputation of the organization itself. And we're talking about credibility in terms of the, of the advertiser and the message. All of it has to have a certain amount of authenticity and honesty and that things represent exactly what it is that they represent. Because the ultimate goal is for the consumer to take in the advertising, to have a certain amount of trust and reliability in what is being advertised, and have a certain amount of buy-in, uh, taking that call to action to, to patronize the business, to make the phone call, to visit the website, to uh, whatever it is that the advertiser is trying to get them to do. All those things have to come into place in order for it to be uh, of value to the advertiser, to be effective to the advertiser, and ultimately that it's a win-win situation for the advertiser for all those reasons for the media outlet as it provides the service to the advertiser and for the consumer who is ultimately going to view that advertising and then do something with it. 
Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time talking in detail about the various ratings, numbers, and formulas, and that sort of thing. Uh, you will get more detail on that when you take the broadcast programming class. Uh, but there is all sorts of information that is out there uh, by going to Nielsen's website and looking up uh, uh, industry websites on how ratings work, uh, especially on the radio side. There's a lot of information that is out there. Allaccess.com is a great resource to be able to see ratings numbers uh, market by market um, for six-plus numbers, uh, which uh, is kind of the general audience. Uh, it gets a little more difficult to pull those numbers up if you're looking for uh, specific demographics. That's generally a uh, proprietary subscriber-based sort of uh, feature uh, that Nielsen offers. Uh, but again, you'll get more detail on those sort of things when you take the broadcast programming class. So those are the notes for Chapter 3. Make sure you take a look at the study questions, fill those out, and uh, be ready for the discussion when we get together for class.